Right, so we're here to talk about the uh, climate crisis tonight, but I guess for some of us, the uh, mind may be on other places in the world at the moment, with what's going on, but we can't really forget the climate crisis because it's going to be with us for a long time, unless we do something about it. So, uh, we have to tonight. So we've got two simple aims, uh, my colleagues and I, on, on here, uh, which is to give you some information, provide an overview, and um, really to start a village discussion. I suppose I should ask, can anybody hear me? Because if not, you can't. Okay, I'm going to switch on. Now can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> See, you should have shouted it before and told me. Who are you? My well, wife was moaning at me, so you can't hear <laughs> Anyway, so I'll start again, but hopefully you heard the first bit. So we've got two simple aims um, to give you some information, um, some of it's a bit depressing, um, and then really to get a village discussion going about the climate and what we can do in the wilderness. That's a little animal. Right, so tonight's agenda um, is I'm going to give you a brief overview, uh, which is the top slide here. Then Nick, um, to me, he's going to answer that question, why me? Um, and then Emma is going to talk about the carbon footprint and how we impact uh, the world. Then uh, Tony is going to talk about the elephant in the room, which is methane, or methane. Um, and then Emma's coming back to talk about housing and transport and some suggestions and discussion around that. And then finally, but not least important is biodiversity, which Rachel is going to talk about um, in the village. And then finally, we've got time for a discussion and the all-important tea and a few biscuits at the end. So please stop around. Um, I will also say that on each of the chairs, there's a form which um, is really asking if you'd like to become uh, a sort of well, join our mailing list really to keep up to date what's going on in terms of the environment and other things which the WEG is doing. Okay, so I'll start by uh, giving a brief overview. Some of you may have seen this graph, it's quite a popular one. Um, it really shows you how the global uh, temperature has risen over the last 200 years or so. Um, if you go back um, to the 1850s, round by the start of the Industrial Revolution, you can see that uh, the Earth was not that warm as, as it goes compared to today. And more recently, over the last sort of 100 years, uh, 80 years, the temperatures have risen. It's now about 1.1, 1.2 degrees higher than it was back in the 1800s. Um, now, that may not seem like a lot, uh, but in a minute you'll see it is quite a lot and it has a big impact on the, the globe. Um, one of the reasons um, for that increase in temperature is CO2. Again, you've probably all read about it, um, greenhouse gases, of which CO2 is the most, uh, probably nastiest. Um, but back in the 1850s, pre-industrial revolution, it was around about 300 parts per million in the atmosphere. It's now 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. Huge increase. Um, and the problem with CO2, it hangs around in the atmosphere for about 100 years. So it's not going to go away very fast. A couple of things um, just to note, uh, really, with that increase in temperature. With every one degree of uh, increase in the global temperature, 7% more water is held in the atmosphere. So that's why we're getting more wet winters and probably more stormy winters. I don't know whether people saw the file last night and they did a feature about um, the Severn River <coughs> and all the people living along it and what was happening there. Um, the other thing is global sea levels 
I mean, our lives. Well, in fact, they have risen by about eight to nine inches in the last hundred years. And they're set to rise, unless we do something about the uh, CO2 levels, by something like 0.3 of a metre to something around two and a half metres by the year 2000 and what? Well, 21. Um, yeah. Um, so a huge increase. I mean, there are other impacts as well. I've just picked on two there, but a lot of biodiversity is going to get uh, lost. Uh, a lot of uh, insect life, plant life, and so forth. I'm just going to show you a film now. Um, this film was well, part of a panorama documentary made back in 1980. You'll find it quite interesting. If, if the technology works. Most meteorologists have come convinced that the climate is likely to change, to change dramatically. Good morning to you. Well, this is a familiar story of cold northwesterly winds this morning, and so here are again. The reason is an odorless, colourless gas produced when we burn fossil fuels. Gas or oil in the engines of power. Dear representatives of the media, I've seen many scientific reports in my time 
but nothing like this. Today's IPCC report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. With fact upon fact, this report reveals how people on the planet are getting clobbered by climate change. Nearly half of humanity is living in the danger zone now. Many ecosystems are at the point of no return now. And checked carbon pollution is forcing the world's most vulnerable on a front march to destruction now. The facts are undeniable. This abdication of leadership is criminal. The world's biggest polluters are guilty of arson on our only home. It is essentially to meet the goal of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And science tells us that will require the world to cut emissions by 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. But according to current commitments, global emissions are set to increase almost 14% over the current decade. That spells catastrophe. It will destroy any chance of keeping 1.5 alive. Today's report underscores two core truths. First, coal and other fossil fuels are choking humanity. All G20 governments have agreed to stop funding coal abroad. They must now urgently do the same at home and dismantle their coal fleets. Those in the private sector still financing coal must be held to account. Oil and gas giants and their underwriters are also on notice. You cannot claim to be green while your plans and projects undermine the 2050 net zero target and ignore the major emission cuts that must occur this decade. He goes on for another three or four minutes. Um, but the point I, I'm trying to make is that, you know, if you look at the 1980 documentary, you look at this report, which was issued three weeks ago, we need to do a lot more. Uh, and I think that's where is what we want to start as a discussion in the village. What more can we do to help the climate? Okay, I'm going to hand over now to Nick then. Between each of the presentations, <coughs> we've got some interesting slides. <laughs> okay. So my bit, hopefully, is going to be short and snappy. Uh, my name's Nick Tooley, I live in Chapel Meadows, and I'm the Secretary of WEG. Is that better? Is that on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. One, two, three. One, two, three? That's yes, right. There are people here in the Wilbrams who, like everywhere else, who are heartily sick of being told repeatedly that they have to do more, they have to pay more, and they have to use less to help save the planet, especially just before and since COP26. People say, don't they, we're already doing our bit and paying for it through the nose. Why should we have to do more and pay more when other countries do so little? For example, I've recently been in Saudi Arabia when visiting my son who lives and works there. Saudi Arabia is a member of the G20 group, group of wealthy nations, but it's 20th, bottom of the list, in phasing out funding for fossil fuel production and use. The Saudis waste everything they've got. Oil is cheap, petrol, believe it or not, is 44p a litre, and they use a lot of it. Electricity is 3 pence a litre and their towns are lit up like Piccadilly Circus. They use 75% more water per head than we do, and there's almost no recycling in Saudi Arabia. And in nine days of travel in that country, I saw one small solar farm, solar installation on a building, not a solar farm, just panels on one building. But here in the UK, we're already paying quite a high price for reducing our impact on the planet. For example, the green levy on energy costs made up 12% of the average electricity bill for a family last year. It cost an average family last year £159, this green levy. And yet the UK is still only in, in 11th place out of those 20 G20, G20 countries in phasing out fossil fuel production and use. So why should we in the UK have to do more pay more and use less when others seem to be doing so little. Well, here are four quick reasons. I hope they're quick anyway. The 
The first one is, historically, it's largely our fault. Uh, we and other Western industrialized countries uh, burned huge quantities of gas and uh, coal and oil, for that matter, uh, to fuel our industrial processes and the society we have today. Um, and the world, is, as we've heard, is trying to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above the 1850 level or thereabouts. It's already gone up by 1.1 degrees of that of the 1.5, and we have to bear a lot of responsibility for that, along with other industrialized countries. Secondly, we and other affluent nations are still emitting too much greenhouse gases. The saying is, isn't it, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, there are masses of different statistics around about greenhouse gases. Some compare countries, some the amounts per person, some measure just CO2, some measure CO2 equivalents, which means they include methane and nitrous oxide, I think it is, Tony Gorin will tell you that. Some per person figures include the CO2 emitted during the manufacture and transport of goods from abroad, which are brought here and which we then consume. And, and uh, this excellent book, as so I see, there's at least two copies of it here, How Bad Are Bananas, by a man called Tim Berners-Lee. You may know that name, oh, Berners-Lee, yeah. but this is his brother. Uh, in that book, uh, Mike Berners-Lee tells you that an average Brit produces or emits roughly 12.3 tonnes of CO2 equivalents at the moment. The sources I have used, the University of Oxford, sorry about that, um, use different figures and show the UK producing 4.85 tonnes per person. The key point, though, is whichever set of figures is right, if they're consistently right or consistently wrong, you can see the difference between different places. So, if you look at my figures there, you can see that the UK is still producing, or emitting rather, about three times as much greenhouse gas as India. This is the middle column. And the Americans are producing three times or more, more than we are. So you can see a stark contrast in the amount per person. We have done a lot. Since uh, 1990, we've reduced our emissions by 50%. They're now the lowest they've been since 1879, when we were fighting the Zulus, and Disraeli was Prime Minister. So we have come quite a way. The third fact I just want to bring up is that we do have the ability here to help poorer and less developed countries. We are, we are tech savvy. We have the scientists, we have the experts who have the experience and knowledge to share with others. We are business savvy. We can show other countries how to adjust their economies as we are doing and make necessary changes there. And then we are finance savvy. In the City of London, we've got plenty of expertise in raising the money to pay for these new technologies to be introduced in other places. And fourthly, I can remember the text, fourthly, we are politically influential. Even now, uh, we are on the world stage everywhere through membership of all the key intergovernmental bodies, through providing grant aid to other countries and so on. And we need to use that influence. Finally, we need to lead by example for others to follow. In 2008, we led the world by setting a target uh, to reduce greenhouse gas by 80% from 1990 levels. And then we upped it, didn't we, to reach net zero by 2050. We can inspire and influence other countries to work harder for the common goal if we work to implement our own promises. So, my final slide talks about the Climate Change Committee, which the government itself set up in 2008. 
it may sometimes find that embarrassing because it doesn't always do what its own committee suggests. You can see that the Climate Committee, the Climate Change Committee at the moment is saying we must deal with emissions in more parts of our economy. Agriculture would be one. Fashion, the fashion industry would be another. Secondly, we've got to monitor more actively and truthfully the progress or lack of it that we're making in getting there. Thirdly, we should stop subsidising fossil fuels through our tax system. Don't ask me for the detail because I'd bore you rigid. Fourthly, we have to change our behaviour. Fly less, drive less, eat better, consume less stuff. <coughs> the last line of the slide says it all, doesn't it? Thank you. I didn't do anything before that. That starts it. It goes forward. I'm going to stay sitting down, I hope you don't mind, because <laughs> I can't hold all the bits. Um, and apologies that I'm going to read out from the script, because I'll just waffle on for a bit. This is a slide in between. Um, so, for those who don't know me, my name's Emma Adams, and I live in Great Ballroom, and I'm an architect. I have a passionate interest in both environmental issues and community projects. And I'd now like to explore how we can put these two things together using community organisations like WEG and community projects to reduce our impact on the planet and build community resilience in the face of climate change. So I'm going to start talking about carbon footprints. You may have heard of the term carbon footprint, which is now an accepted universal measure. According to the WHO definition, it is a measure of the impact your activities have on the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere produced through the burning of fossil fuels, and it's expressed as a weight of CO2, or CO2 equivalents, produced in tonnes and usually expressed per year. The UK 2021 target is 10.5 tonnes per adult per year. I've got to stick with the same charts. Um, you can see, hope you can recognise where that is. Um, and that's actually courtesy of Ian Cummings, the picture from his drone. Um, you may think that living in a rural community and possibly working from home, that your footprint is light. However, a modern rural existence is supported by mass production or energy expended elsewhere. Little is produced locally these days, and whilst lots of goods from who knows where are magically delivered by Amazon to our door. Even invisible things like your Google search or your WhatsApp message is stored somewhere, using continuous energy for our own convenience. It is really hard to compute the impact of our lifestyles, and it can be overwhelming trying to think about it. It makes one feel pretty hopeless. So the, this taste of talk is about breaking that down into simple numbers and that can give you manageable, manageable choices. So if we are mu just mildly interested or even very committed, how do we understand the scale of the problem and what we need to do on a personal or community level to reduce our impact? How do we tread lightly on this earth? What is a sustainable household footprint? What should we be aiming for? Is it even possible? A carbon footprint calculator makes this an easier task. <coughs> I've looked at several carbon footprint calculators and the World Wildlife Fund one is by far the easiest, quickest and most intuitive to use. It is recommended by many. It's designed for UK households and uses data from the ONS. I would recommend sticking to one source of information. Different calculators or tables use different criteria, making it really difficult to compare across sources. So do this and stick with it, and you'll know where you are. You can look up what the World Wildlife Calculator includes in the footprint on the information page. It doesn't ask complicated questions that would need you to look up bills or anything. It uses a simple set of multiple choice questions, of which there's a few up there just as examples. It probably takes about three or four minutes to complete. It's 
very quick. Um, multiple choice questions about your circumstances and habits that are easy to answer. Like for instance, you know, how long do you spend in your car? Not how many miles do you drive? But it does ask you what kind of car and what fuel and stuff. Um, it then calculates an adult footprint in tonnes per year. And at the end, it compares your footprint to the UK average and also to a linear reduction of the UK average footprint to zero between 2016 and 2045. So you can see if you're behind, ahead or on track to where you should be to meet the UK carbon goals. What's even more helpful is that you can go back and change your answers and see what impact that has. I have to say that's if you do it on the, on the actual web. And they have an app, but if you use the app, you can't change anything. But if you do it on your computer, just on their web page, you can go back and change things. So, for instance, two flights to Rome added 16% to my annual footprint. So, that's, that's quite expensive in, in carbon. Having an electric car with the amount of driving I do reduced it by 15%, while eating meat added 15%. So you can fiddle around and see what decisions you'd like to take and see what effect it has. <coughs> so you can see the effect of dietary transport or sh shopping choices, for example. Okay. As a com comparison, I calculated my mother's carbon footprint. <laughs> yeah, no. She's 90, lives alone in a two-bed bungalow and doesn't get out much, particularly during COVID. So I was surprised to find her footprint is almost two and a half times mine. But you can click on the screen and get a pie graph and look at the proportions. And I discovered a mistake. Hers was almost 70% allocated to the home. I looked again and realised I'd made a mistake. Her electricity tariff should have been 100% renewable, which is offered as standard to all E.ON customers. And although I don't show it, this brought her footprint down by 50%. <coughs> so a clear lesson highlighting the impact that buying and supporting renewable energy has on your footprint. So I would challenge everyone here to bite the bullet, calculate their own footprint this week. It may not be totally accurate, but it will give you a good indication. And then you can decide for yourself what to do about it. It's all down to personal circumstance and choice. Some individuals or families will have very little choice in what they can change, and some will have the luxury of choice. This talk is just aimed at aiming at, to raise the question and to equip us to quantify the problem. And then the choices, or lack of them, are then up to the individual. There are lots of ways to reduce your carbon footprint, but a good place to start looking for ideas would be to, by reading How Bad Are Bananas, so we've seen this before. Um, by Mike berners -Lee. It's an easy book to dip into and to get quantitative understanding of carbon footprints of all sorts of everyday choices. It's a very easy read and gives great examples on how to shop for everyday items taking into account their footprint. And I have to say, it's not all obvious. So you think you know, but you'll find out you don't. Um, we could have a whole information evening on different ways to reduce our carbon footprint, but I will finish with a simple takeaway on food and shopping. For reasons that most people already know, or we could discuss at another talk, a vegetarian diet can save 25% of an average personal footprint, and a vegan diet can save up to 40%. And I'm assuming you all know why, but it's just... Uh, the amount of food it takes to feed a cow to feed you <laughs> compared to. Um, that is a massive difference. If you look at the diagram of the burger to see the impact that the meat content has when it's drawn to the scale of its carbon footprint compared to the bun or the cheese or whatever. However, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. Cutting down and establishing a healthy mixed diet with less meat or dairy or being flexitarian, as they call it now, takes you a long way so, you know, just doing something is worth doing, rather than thinking you have to do everything. I think that's a big message. Um, more importantly, it depends where your food comes from and whether it's in season. If you have a vegan diet full of out-of-season exotic ingredients that have been air freighted, it can have the same footprint as a diet with locally raised meat. So you can take your choices. Um, 
So coming back to how bad are bananas, well, they may be exotic, but they're very good. They're grown in natural sunlight with no hot housing required. They're picked green. They require no packaging or cooling, and they're sent by boat, which is 1% of the carbon footprint of air freight. So you compare this to a punnet of grapes bought in the winter, often from South Africa or South America, and air freighted due to their short shelf life. Their footprint is 26 times the footprint of bananas for the same weight. So that's just the difference between two fruit that you might just pick up in the supermarket. So be mindful and shop wisely. Ditch the winter asparagus and buy in season. Buy what can be grown locally, ship by boat or by road if not too far. Changing consumer habit, habits will eventually bring the supermarkets along with you. That's me. That's me done for this bit. Yeah. Hello, I'm Tony and I'm a bit of a scientist and this seven minute presentation is called Methane, the Elephant in the Room and Our Climate. It describes our problem as I perceive it and why we need to worry. First, the elephant in the room. And to start with, 20 Canadian dollars I paid for that. Here's a short quote from a poem by Nimi Calvati called Mahout. A Mahout being a person who works with and rides an elephant. The opening two lines are, we trust each our own elephant till our own elephant kills us. About 45 years ago I started working. Um, I worked for 30 years in pollution control and regulation for regulatory bodies. Our main task was to try to prevent pollution from waste disposal activities. And I learned very quickly that we as a society always choose the most immediate and cheapest financial options for disposing of the waste we produce. There's little or no foresight. Much of our solid waste is buried in rubbish tips. Some is simply left to pile up, for example, from plastic, which is piling up everywhere, to high-level radioactive waste, which are simply stored somewhere in the hope they won't leak for the next 20,000 years or so. Our sewage, plus liquid waste from factories, ends up in watercourses or the sea after a basic treatment at a sewage works, for instance. Exhausts from our heating, cars, flies, cruises, etc., pump neat gases into the atmosphere willy nilly. Our short-sightedness is a huge elephant in the room. So what about the bungalow in the overhead? In 1986, the waste industry woke up when this bungalow in Losco, Derbyshire, exploded. The cause was methane, migrating from a nearby rubbish tip. The three people inside, you might imagine, were badly injured. As a result, more attention was paid to the risks associated with methane escaping from rubbish tips. And the use of portable monitors to measure methane levels in and around rubbish tips became the norm. And we always measured in units of volume. In our, in our atmosphere, methane is at a much lower concentration than the top five gases and is measured in parts per billion. But its concentration is rising steeply because of our activities and it has a much, much greater climate warming potential than carbon dioxide, at least a hundred times. To start off with. The volume of gases and how I visualise the volume of the gases we are releasing. This overhead includes a little science joke too. There is not so there's no such principle as the avocado principle. The 846 grams of carbon dioxide is simply a figure calculated and intended to describe the carbon cost of getting those two avocados to our plates in the UK, as Emma has described. With this sort of knowledge, we might choose to adjust our own behaviours to reduce our emissions, to buy more locally, for instance, or to alter what we eat. 
There really is a Navogadro principle. It tells us accurately how much volume any given amount or weight of a particular gas occupies. The behaviour of a hot air balloon demonstrates the effects of temperature on gases, and the Avogadro principle defines the science behind it. So if you think of carbon dioxide gas at sea level, about the level of this hall floor for, for a moment, a tonne of it fills about 500 cubic metres. This is roughly the same as the volume of this room, 12 metres square and 3 or 4 metres high. For methane, the volume of a tonne is about three times the volume of this room. It is estimated that as much as 40 billion tonnes of man-made emissions of carbon-containing gases are now released annually worldwide. Billions of times the volume of this room. So where do all these gases go? The short answer is not very far. The huge atmosphere that we see from Earth is very misleading. The reality is that everything with a weight, including gases, is attracted to the Earth by gravity. And the greatest proportion, 80 to 90 percent, is held within the layer closest to the Earth, the troposphere. <coughs> this is the thin horizontal orange layer in the diagram, and it extends at the moment to a maximum of about nine. nine miles from the Earth's surface. Now it's just a little further than to Cambridge or the Market, an onion skin combined to the diameter of the Earth. This nine mile thin layer is where all the different gases mix and where most atmospheric reactions and events are taking place. It's where the weather happens, it's where the warming is happening. By adding more heat we are adding energy, leading to more and more turbulence. It's quite straightforward. Imagine, for instance, the movement of water in a kettle or saucepan as the temperature rises, and how that movement increases with temperature, and the bubbles just get bigger. So this is the photo of the Earth's atmosphere taken from by NASA from the space station. This is our beautiful and vulnerable planet. It's all we have. It is endangered by the actions of human beings. This is the first time in the Earth's existence that a climate change event has been driven by an animal. Methane makes up about 3% of weight by weight of our annual gaseous emissions. But its global warming potential is calculated as being at least 60 times more damaging in the short term than carbon dioxide. And the short term reductions are altogether crucial. Put a different way, methane is currently about 20% of our problem and growing. Its main sources are rubbish tips, livestock enteric fermentation, which leads to farts, rice paddy fields, and the fossil fuel industry. Much more methane gas is held in geological formations laid down millions of years ago, and the risk of its release from these formations is growing because Rising temperatures are causing vast amounts of ice that currently lock in this methane to melt. To make a difference, we have to make personal decisions with care. <coughs> Generally speaking, it is the most affluent of us who tend to have the largest carbon footprints and who are therefore able to contribute most effectively to reducing total carbon emissions by changing their lifestyles. And many of us here fit into that description. Each of us has to be diligent in deciding what to believe, even from governmental sources, in our own decision-making processes. Ultimately, if we are to have any hope of halting, let alone reversing, the damaging changes in our atmosphere, we all find ourselves with a single simple choice about our lifestyles. Do we, as individuals, wish to continue to make matters worse by our actions, by resisting or avoiding change, or do we wish to try to help hold the madness by, by changing our ways?
Um, so I'm going to now look at um, community carbon footprints. So the things that we can't control as individuals, unless we do things together. Um, another way... <coughs>
basically someone putting their car out to hire for somebody else through an app which sorts out all the insurances and everything. Um, but maybe they, you know, these are things that we could talk about. Um, you know, cars typically sit on our drive for 90% of the week. So it's trying to use them more efficiently and share them so that we don't have so many blocks of metal just sitting there uh, and using less fuel. Um, do we need electric car charging in community buildings to, to offer for the people who've only got on-street parking? So that's another option. Um, and do people have any other ideas to reduce transport carbon footprint? Or the, sorry, the carbon footprint of owning and running cars in this village because we are stuck by our location. So that, that would be a whole evening's worth of discussion, basically. But these are ideas, and I think we should just start talking about them. Um, I think if we were to seriously take any of them up, we would need to have a detailed survey of everyone's transport needs and habits and really kind of get stuck in. But, you know, what's stopping us? There may be some things that we can do, some light touch things or some more structural things that we can do to A, your reduce the amount of car ownership, make it cheaper for people who can't afford it, work together in a collaborative way, like we have done through COVID by doing shopping for each other. And, you know, there are all sorts of things we can do. Um, the next big topic um, is that affects our community footprint is housing. Um, the impact on ha of housing comes mainly from heating and also powering appliances and lighting. There's also the embodied carbon in how we build, which as an architect I know about, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, our options for heating are restricted to oil, electricity, coal or wood. To minimise the consumption of any of these, the most important thing to do, and I put it in capitals, is to insulate. This is an area where I do have an experience, so I'm happy to run workshops or do individual assessments to guide people in improving their house. You should be aiming to make your house into a tea cosy. Then you will need minimal inputs to heat it. In Germany, they have a standard called passive house, which is so well insulated and airtight that they need the equivalent of a one bar electric fire to heat them in the winter. And obviously we are a long way from that in the UK. Our building regs regulation is going to change this summer. They haven't changed since 2010. They've been talking about it for a long time, so it's taken you know, 12 years to um, change them. And they will go up, but not to pass the standards. So, anyway. The only realistic carbon, low carbon option that moves away from fossil fuels is to install heat pumps, which normally heat hot water to feed your radiators or underfloor heating. They're run by electricity, which increasingly can be produced with renewables on a national scale. The building that you're sitting in, this one, is heated by an air source heat pump via pipes in this concrete floor. And it's clearly warm enough today because we've got the windows open. Another kind is a ground source heat pump, which involves burying lengths of pipe in the ground or drilling a borehole that extracts the latent heat from the earth. Air source, heat, air source heat pumps are cheaper to install than ground source, but both require the buildings to be well insulated first because you'll spend an awful lot of money on electricity if your house is not well insulated. Um, there are a growing number of people in the villages who have done this and they could talk about the pros and cons. The grant system for pumps is just changing on the 1st of April to a £5,000 flat rate contribution rather than the grant paid for seven years. Um, so that's your own house. Um, we have a neighbouring village, Swaffham Prior, who are pioneering the first community heat pump project in the country. It will be really interesting to see how it goes. I mean, they've, they've got a lot of central government funding to do this, and it's a big task, but it will be interesting whether it works. Um, could this be a model for the Wilbrams? Emma Fletcher, who has driven this project, may be able to come and talk to us. She's very inspiring. Other parishes are starting to look at this model, and I know that Grantchester are in the feasibility stages of a similar local heat network. <coughs> is there an option to increase the amount of new renewable energy generation in our community? Individuals have been fitting solar to roof for many years, and can this be scaled up? I know that the, count, is it the county yes. has 
schemes for purchasing <coughs> solar together. So that is, you know, that's really interesting. Um, Wang has already assisted the primary school in looking at panels for the primary school roof and putting them together, putting the school together with grant systems. And so that project hopefully is going ahead in the summer. Um, Reach has a community solar farm installed in 2016 by raising 340,000 with a share issue to 112 residents. <coughs> This made a 3% return for the investors and a small surplus for local charities. It powers 50% of the village. I mean, I know we've got lots of solar around us and there may be more coming, but you know, do we want to do our own? That's a question we could ask ourselves. Gambling Gay has a community wind turbine. What were the financial models for this and are they viable now? Because they are projects that happened five or ten years ago. So. So if anyone has expertise on these transport or housing issues and would like to join a subcommittee or an interest group, please write something down on your form and get in touch with us. I think that's me done. Good evening. Can you hear me without using the mic? Because I'm very much a hand person. So... Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Fantastic. You can't? Oh, oh, let me grab the... Where's the mic? There we go. I thought I had a big enough playground voice, but clearly not. <laughs> um, good evening. Uh, my name is Rachel Stewart. I'm a very relative newcomer to the village. We moved last spring into Angle End. Um, thank you very much for the welcome to the village, including Weg. Um, the, the reason I, I'm here today do the, the, the piece on biodiversity. My background's very much outdoor learning and environmental education. So that's where I sort of come from. I've done projects with the Wildlife Trust BCN locally, and I currently work for the university delivering their biodiversity action plan. So hence why I'm doing this part of, of, the, of the talk. So what is biodiversity to start with? It's the, the de technical definition is the variety and the variability of life on Earth. So everything that's wild, basically. Um, the images that I have up there are all taken locally. They're all within a few miles of here. So it sort of demonstrates what we have from a biodiversity wildlife perspective locally. However, Cambridge is one of the most nature-depleted counties in the country. So we need to do something about that. First off, why should we be conserving biodiversity? You, you know, what's that? What, what, you know, answering that question, my first one would be because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes we should just do things because it's the right thing. So there's the morals and ethics of why we should be conserving biodiversity. If you need more reasons, biodiversity does so much for us. So the second one I've got on there is ecosystem services. And what that means in a nutshell is wildlife cleans the air for us. It filters our water. Aquatic plants help filter those water systems. Plant roots help hold the soil together, stopping soil erosion and, and, and runoff and, and flooding issues. There's all sorts of things ecosystems do for us. The whole of our talk today has been about sustainability and biodiversity provides us that win-win solution. If we keep what we've got and we stop removing it, we're keeping carbon in the system. It's staying where it is. It's not going into the atmosphere. If we enhance and improve our local biodiversity, it's sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, so helping us solve that sustainability problem. So biodiversity can really help us with those goals. There's lots of economic advantages if we needed even more reasons why we should be preserving biodiversity. The last two years really emphasise that. We've had a global pandemic. A large part of the reason that has happened is because we're encroaching on, on biodiversity, on habitats. That cross between humans and other species is how pathogens are jumping across that species barrier. And we can see what that problem that's caused us over the last couple of years. There's a huge wealth of medicinal plants out there we haven't even discovered that we could use. By removing biodiversity, we don't have the option to use those anymore. And the, the last one I'm going to mention, there are more, it's food production, pollinators. Without pollinators, without bees and other invertebrates, we can't produce food. 
we don't have anything to eat. So you know, it provides us with really economic advantages by protecting and preserving biodiversity. Last one I've got up there, well-being and health. I don't know about you, but the last two years, if I couldn't have gone for my daily walk in the middle of that pandemic, I wouldn't have got through it. You know, we need nature just to feel good. It's good for us. There's lots of studies also showing green exercise, just exercising, looking at a picture of greenery, reduces your heart rate and your blood pressure. The advantage are even higher if you're going outside to do that exercise. So, you know, there's lots of advantages as to why we should conserve biodiversity and why we should also try and enhance what we've already got. You're on the home straight the last couple of slides. <laughs> so, I am very much a glass half full, full type of person. And a lot of what we've talked about today are the problems, and it would be nice if we could go away with a few solutions. So my penultimate slide are a few really basic things that we can do. And again, all of these images that are on here have been taken locally. The first thing I can encourage people to do in your own green spaces, so whether this is your window boxes, your gardens, your plant pots, leave a bit more of a mess. Feel able to not have a wonderfully manicured outdoor space. Nature doesn't care. Nature likes a mess. Nature likes you to leave all your plant stalks over the winter so that invertebrates can hibernate in them. Nature loves piles of leaves to overwinter in. So that's one thing we could all do very easily is just be slightly messy with our gardening. Leave that patch of nettles where it is. Mow less so you've got some clover and a plaque with your lawn rather than just an expanse of very, very pristine green. Think about what you're planting. Feed the bees, those pollinators that we need to produce our, our foodstuffs. Planting native, nectar-rich plants will go a really long way to, to enhancing your garden spaces. One of the most wonderful things about moving here was sitting in my garden and a hedgehog running across the lawn. I've never been quite so excited. It was absolutely fantastic. That's got in our garden somehow, because there's a network of other gardens that support and provide foodstuffs and a habitat for that hedgehog to live. So enabling access in and out of your garden. I know it's not possible if you've got pets sometimes, but if you, you can leave a little gap in your hedge to allow wildlife to travel around the village, that in itself is really beneficial. And the last suggestion I've got there is a simple what can we do? Provide a tiny water source, even if it's a little bowl with some pebbles and water in that provides us a water source for invertebrates. It doesn't have to be a huge, difficult pond or something that requires a lot of maintenance or a big habitat, but just providing a little bit of water can be really, really beneficial for wildlife. Okay, the last slide of the presentation, and from me, is what can we do? We've got you all here today because the way we're going to make a difference is because of all of you. It's not going to be just the few of us here, it needs to be a much wider collective effort. If we can link up our existing green spaces, if we can think on a much bigger scale, on a landscape scale, if we can think about connecting to our Fenland, we talked, I talked earlier about how improving uh, um, habitats can help capture carbon. Wetland habitats like Fenland are way more effective at capturing carbon from the atmosphere than planting a tree where the benefits you get are going to happen over a much longer time period. So restoring our natural wetlands is really, really key to capturing carbon as well as all those biodiversity benefits. How can we involve our neighbours, so not just our local neighbours and next door neighbours, those wider neighbours, our, our farming community, other businesses and commercial um, areas within, within our local community. So we're joining all of those green spaces up. How can we work with the local councils and other partners? How can we get expert groups involved to support us as novices as to, to what we need to do as a community? And I think it's just about us thinking, how can we have that wider influence? Because collectively, we can make a much bigger difference. So that is the last slide in the talk. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening.